discussions with the organizers here what is really meant by petrification and uh, I'm still a skeptic but we'll see what comes out of it. Uh, uh, I shall be talking about what happens after migration when a migrating population settles down and start to socialize and interact and create a new culture. Whether what you want to call that I don't know but, <laughs> but uh, and, and also, you could you make the argument that that uh, there's never such a thing as petrification because there's all this change going on, and interpretation should never petrify, should it? <laughs> so we'll see. We'll see where we land. Okay, we are in the middle of the third science revolution in archaeology. Uh, it's a revolution on par with the C14. Revolution and on par with the revolution of archaeology was formed. It is a revolution in the sense that the, a breakthrough within science had created a completely new, all the new window to knowledge that was not possible before. Uh, and uh, therefore forces archaeologists to rethink their models and re-theorize. And in that sense, uh, it's of course uh, the right moment to suggest new theories and new models of interpretation. Uh, we can start now, rather than debating if migration took place as we've been doing over the last hundred years without never ever uh, coming to a conclusion, or, then we now know when migration took place and we can instead, we are fr intellectually freed to start to ask more interesting questions how and why, and what happens after migration. And that's what I'm going to talk about here. Um, but basically what I want to say here also, we are in the beginning of a completely new understanding of prehistory. So uh, everything has to be tentative. Uh, now we know that by the around 3000 BC, there was a decline all over northern and western Europe in the Neolithic settlements. Uh, even before we know there was a collapse of the big mega settlements in Ukraine already also. So what we see universally, globally, is uh, the, a decline of, of, of Neolithic, uh, Neolithic activities. And what, did that, what does that mean? This was one of the questions we had in our research group when we have worked with this uh, geneticist and archaeologist in close collaboration uh, over the last five years. And um, therefore, we asked the geneticist to go back and look for diseases. Because we said, you know, migrations are not enough to explain how the step you could come to dominate completely also genetically. Something more must be going on. And they came back and told us that, uh, and actually one of the main authors here, uh, here now today, Simon, uh, Rush was sitting there. Uh, he did a fantastic job uh, on, uh, on that. And we, had, uh, we were able to show that we have plague 3000 BC from Siberia to the Baltic. And the Yamaya people, they, uh, they, have, they, have, they were acquainted with the plague already and they brought it along with them. And my prediction is that we will be able to show in the future that, uh, or that Neolithic populations declined uh, due to plague. Um, and also, uh, here are the, here are the, we, we have these eight cases uh, of plague. And therefore, when we have the migrations, you could, say, you could argue that the plague traveled in advance of the migrations. There were the first initial, there were all this contact, there were initial migrations into Bulgaria, East Southeastern Europe, uh, into Hungary, and the plague would, would spread. 
Uh, and you would have this decline that would open up new possibilities for these migrant groups. It would be easier for them uh, to, to settle and, uh, and, and to come to, do to dominance. But, and who were they? Well, what we know now is that they were tall, they were healthy, uh, more healthy than Neolithic people. Uh, and uh, they had a different diet based on on meat and milk products, and we also see here the first, uh, the first, uh, the first appearance of lactose tolerance. Uh, but only 10 to 15 percent of these people had it yet. Uh, when they settled, and this is something that's been overlooked uh, in in previous debate, they settled in areas that look as much as possible as steppe areas. Flat, open lands with forest, light forests that they could easily burn off and create those open steppe-like environments they were used to. And that's exactly what they did in Western Jutland, Northern Germany, in Holland, uh, in Switzerland. They simply burned off the forest and created uh, grasslands. <laughs> And they kept burning off, uh, we can show that from pond diagrams on the barrows. And they had virtually no agriculture, very little agriculture in the first phase. And uh, they created the same kind of long lines of barrows in the landscape to connect uh, the environment um, exactly the, as you find it in the steppe. And they brought with them uh, a new um, uh, burial tradition. Obviously there would still be nearly population uh, surviving and, and persisting and some of these encounters were, as we know very well from Eulau here, could be quite dramatic uh, and people could be killed. But what we notice here and what my point here is that the women from Eulau uh, or Eulau, they, they were non-locals. They were brought in from, uh, from 60-70 kilometers north of what has been uh, said to be the is it Schoenfeld culture, I think it is. Uh, so what we see here is something that must have been the, the normal situation. New migrants come in, and most of these new migrants we now know were young males or males, um, much like today. They are willing to take risks and they are the ones who cannot inherit you know, the herd. They are always a surplus of young males in pastoral groups. And they have to find a career. Uh, in Denmark, in Jutland, 90% of all burials of the early space, uh, of, uh, of the early space in barrows are made. Are made. So this is a very strongly male-dominated migration in the initial phase. And the initial phase has virtually no material culture. We have, we, have, we have dated a number of burials, and we know that they are very early. And some of the very early ones, like in, we have in Poland and South Germany, we have hammer-headed pins of the step type. Here we have the early migrants, because the young Naya culture had no real pottery tradition. They were mobile, all the material culture was, uh, was in, in, in mats, in woven things, in in more in things they could move and which wouldn't uh, crack up like pottery. So basically, they come with them with a mobile material culture that leave no traces. And the early grave have have rarely any pottery. Pottery will only come after some generations when they start to get marry in women. And that's what we have shown in our latest study. Also, we saw that this uh, ERC project we have been running over the last five years. We have, uh, together with Doc Price, uh, we have analyzed around 60 burials from South Germany. We have the early phase and we have a majority in the middle phase. But what we see here is that, first of all, we can see that here we have uh, two of the cemeteries. They have a very protein rich um, uh, diet compared to Neolithic groups which uh, eat a lot more cereals, get a lot of uh, bad teeth, grow, grow, grow down instead of up, you know, over time. 
so here we have the new diet that's here. But what we also have here, we have a quite a large group of non-locals. And this large group of non-locals was predominantly women. So here we have Eula, Eula was no accident. It was not a singular event. We can show here that the normal thing in the, in the mature phase of the corded wear culture was to marry in women from other groups outside. And where did they come from? Well, their diet was Neolithic. They had a different diet in their childhood than the male population uh, who are still on meat and milk, as we interpret it. So my scenario here is really that you have all these uh, migrating Yamla people coming in. They are dominantly male. They bring in women. Neolithic women, what do they do? They make pottery. Because they know how to do that. And therefore, they start to imitate the organic material culture of the Yamnaya people in wood and bast and all kinds of material. And, they, and, and that becomes the court wear. Uh, they also, well, I'll come to, so here's a model of how I see uh, the scenario. We start with Yamna migrant, migrants coming in here, dominantly male, they marry in women, this is the early phase of the Cordoba Singlet culture in Northwestern Europe, as we know it. Uh, a huge migration. 30,000 barrels built within four, uh, 400 years. Pollen diagram shows the, the, the biggest forest clearance in history. Uh, and oh, it doesn't work. And then. Once they settle, and after a few generations, then marry in Neolithic people, because you have still TRB people living on the Danish islands or in Eastern Jutland, they start marrying in, they bring with them new skills in pottery uh, production, they also, uh, they also new skills in how to grow cereals that they, uh, that they can bring along. And uh, here we then have the work of Gush, Cronin and Rune Iverson uh, still in print, but uh, Goose has made a, a, a fantastic piece of work where he has catalogued uh, all the terms for for crops, and he can show that that uh, the uh, the crops uh, the vocabulary for crops in uh, in proto Indo European is non-existent really. And uh, the categories for crops we have are coming from a substrat language that is non-Indo-European. So the TRB people, or whatever they were, Bernburger in, in Central or South Germany, they spoke a non-Indo-European language. They had all the terms for crops. They were adopted by the newcomers. Uh, and who teach you language? Women. Uh, so the Neolithic women comes in with, all the, with these new skills and they start also to learn new language and in that process you get a hybrid development. They bring in their terms, they adopt, you know, and um, so in that process over time you will develop something called pre-proto-Germanic or whatever you call it. So this process that goes on here is really how a new material culture is created through, um, through exogamy as a, 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 a long-term strategy. And that will not only create a new uh, material culture, that will also create a new language that becomes a hybrid between an, uh, uh, an existing Neolithic language and a Proto-Indo-European language. So in this way, we can what we can do now and what we are working on now is really to go into high resolution analysis of the local processes, which we can then generalize and, and, and forward as a model for what went on in the wider regions. So far we have documented this only in a, in a smaller region, 
but I suggest we can generalize uh, the results and it makes us understand how a new material is created and it makes us understand why archaeologists have been so wrong about migration over the last 40, 50 years because everyone looks at pots they should have been looking at burial uh, rituals, you know, single birds. They should have been look, looked at the way you organize your barrels in the landscape, and then they would have realized it's exactly the same as in the step. But everyone looked at material culture, and material culture is movable and prone to change and will hybridize. And it was created in a process after settling down. Okay, that's my take on vitrification. Thank you. <laughs> Oh,